Speaking of great talents, Christine Hesaw has just arrived. Are you eyeing the biscuits? I am indeed. Oh, it's lovely. It's too early for those yummy sorts of treats, is it? Now, we're trying out this huge microphone that Andy's decided <laughs> is going to make... It's almost as big as my face. It is a big one, isn't it? It is indeed, which is great. I'm not used to such a big microphone. Sounds great. Does sounds it? great. Sounds it works out. okay? Yes, we're, we're, we're absolutely... Good, good. Yep, Tell yep. me when I'm on air. You are, right oh, now. Right now. <laughs> Fabulous. I'm sharing this with everybody. Yes, it's a big microphone and, yes, there are some delicious morning tea treats. Now, so, are you going to have a glass of red wine or are you going to have a cup no, of tea or a cup of coffee? No, I have anything at this stage. I've, um, I'm still adjusting my time clock. As you know, I've just got back from four months in Paris or in France. What a life. So right now it's feeling a lot like dinner, so it's more like a red wine or champagne time. But What a life. Yeah, it's been fabulous. Yeah. Well, I mean, your daughter lives there, doesn't she? She? she does indeed, and uh, so I spent most of the time babysitting. And let me tell you, I'm too old to be a grandmother. Do you, uh, no, 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 no. You're too young to be a grandmother. Well, either way, it, it's hard work. Um, you know, nobody ever trained me to be a grandmother, and full time for four weeks. We took them uh. away for four weeks without the parents. So uh. we had them from six o'clock in the morning till about ten o'clock at night, without any breaks for four weeks. So um, it was uh, wonderful. Do they speak but, French? Of course. Well, they are French. Yes, I guess um, they are. So <laughs> they also speak English. Uh, but, yes, they do say to me frequently, Gigi, just speak English. You know, your French is not good enough. So uh, I try very <laughs> hard, but I don't always succeed. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, They're that... fun. They're fun. They're three and six. We went uh, up to Chamonix, which is in the mountains, and uh, that was great and did some walks and lovely time together. And then we went down to Caro, mm-hmm. which is in the south of France, and that was fabulous too, quite near Marseille, which was a little bit dangerous. There had been quite a few bombings and um, lots of things happening in Marseille. We're very lucky here. We do complain, but we've not got that much to complain about in Adelaide. No, but we don't want to do anything that is going to divide or cause conflict where True. we should work on harmony. Absolutely. Um, that's one of the things that they find so hard there. You know, it's all very well to have, um, you know, the idea of democracy, and I know you were talking about it earlier, but uh, in France it's become a real problem because everybody believes that they have a right to voice pretty angrily their own opinions and there are lots of almost ghettos of different feelings throughout Paris and France and we saw a lot of riots, we saw a lot of people protesting um, everybody gets together almost on a daily basis and there'll be different coloured jackets or different coloured flags or whatever and it's quite divisive. Quite yeah, divisive. Uh, yeah, I suppose the temperament, the French temperament, it, it, it strikes such. me they are excitable. A- absolutely, uh, including my grandchildren. Um, but, uh, yes, I, I think that it's it's been part of... I mean, when you think about it, um, it, it was only 200 years ago when Concorde was in fact a guillotine. And, uh, you know, now we went through the Marine, which had just been opened on the corner of Place de la Concorde. And 200 years ago, it wasn't a great big obelisk from Egypt. It was a guillotine. And we heard the tale of two cities and Madame Defarge. Yeah, it's a constant reminder. Yeah, (laughs) and it is. So, you know, and they've always been of the mind that they, uh, they are citizens of the state and have an opinion. Yeah. When you started out in journalism... I suppose you. you, you I'm I very look, young. You mm. were very. I do remember. Mm. I do remember that. Uh, We've known each other that long. We have. Yes, that's fifty years <laughs> plus. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and uh, indeed it is. And mm. I, I, you, there was a. Um, Oh, golly, what was it? A, 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 was it a waiter's competition or something like that at a, a motel on South Terrace? Yes, it was indeed. Uh, I think it was the Park Royal. Park Royal, yeah. It was a swimming pool. It had a and swimming pool. All, was, all, we were all sort of gathered around there mm-hmm. and there was a – I don't know whether we were waiting or – we were judging the waiters or whatever. Probably part Pro- of a media competition. Promotion you know, Radio was. versus newspaper or uh, something yeah, yeah, yeah. like and that. Yeah, and you, you yeah. were wearing a red jumper. Was I? There you it go. Was very memorable. Uh, well, I've still got red jumpers <laughs> in my wardrobe, so there you go. Uh, yeah. Hopefully a different one from the one I had back then. So uh, you, you were a journalist. I was. I, st- I consider myself still to be a journalist. Yeah, I'm well, always a journalist. How long were you doing the day-to-day grind of, of journalism? Uh, well, I started at 19 and um, very soon became the court reporter at The Advertiser and then the fashion editor. And then I moved to Harper's Bazaar, as you recall. Yeah. And then back to SA Life 
and spent a decade there and um, continued writing basically. And I, I never felt it was a grind. For me it was a passion. So I kept working until the birth of my granddaughter in 2017. So that's not that long ago. Yeah. Um, and then I decided to have a break when she had her baby. Mm. But when you look back on journalism, uh, I think in a way... Uh, I have, in my own sort of um, uh, interpretation of journalism, because um, I think you have to be able to spell to be a good journalist, and I certainly <laughs> can't do that. Uh, I can dictate and I can I can talk, but I can't. <laughs> I don't think I want to sit behind a typewriter. But I'm, what I'm saying is, I think we probably have seen the best years of the profession. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, um, now anybody can write, they can get their computer out and, um, you know, imitate uh, a thesis at university, yeah. uh, a book, a poem, um, you know, that's what's happening. And I think they'll see a lot of careers change and end as a consequence. Uh, it's going to be quite scary. I think, um, you know, I've spoken to people quite recently who are having to endorse Faux writing for newspapers and for um, so in journalism, but mm. also in education, and I think that's frightening too. But yeah, in journalism, it was always exciting. I mean, you talk about how long ago I was a journalist, and I was nineteen, and I worked for the Advertiser, and I remember Christmas Day had just begun when my editor rang me and said, and and that was on not on a mobile, that was on a <laughs> dialer phone, yeah. and um, and rang me and said, uh, you're not having Christmas dinner, you're in here, Cyclone Tracy's just happened. Yeah. And we all raced in and the entire news force was in the paper. And it was back in the days when you had um, hot metal to make the paper, yes. lines of hot metal. Hot print. And uh, so we were trying to reach anybody that had managed to get out of Darwin. There was no um, con no contact at all. We finally started feeling, hearing people arriving in Catherine and other outposts as they'd managed to escape and then yeah. get to a phone booth and ring us or we'd ring them at the motel in Catherine and the like and we pieced together what had happened because it was the only way we were finding out about mm. what had actually happened and talking to people. And every time you got... Anybody through, you tapped out even a line of copy, held it in the air, a copy taker would grab it, take it over to the editors, sub-editors, and then it would go over to the other building, be made into a change in the copy. And it was so exciting because we watched the front page and other pages change all the time. And we all worked through till about 4am. But these were exciting times for it a journalist. It was fabulous. It was fabulous. And I mean, I lived through so many of those wonderful times in journalism it was an adrenaline kick but it was also something that made you yeah. always want to do and journalism. that paper of course was a different paper i don't know whether it was the print i don't know whether it was the the, uh, the size others. of the paper or, or the smell it was a better of the quality ink. i mean it was a broadsheet it wasn't a tabloid no that's I true yes, yes 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 so it was a broadsheet and it wasn't meant as a commuter paper it was meant to be read and enjoyed over a cup of coffee mm. and a sweet treat. You haven't got your coffee yet? Not yet. I'm very oh. happy not having it yet. But um, <laughs> uh, it was certainly those sorts of times when journalism was a quality product and we had more journalism journalists than the articles that made the paper. Now it's all syndicated. Most of it is produced elsewhere and then just touched up. Um, we were We were very thorough with... Checking our facts, that doesn't happen anymore. There wasn't the bias that there is now because it's cheaper to just take somebody's press release than to investigate the truth of it. Mm -hmm. I think journalism's changed a lot and for the worse, unfortunately. Where do you think it's going? <laughs> mm -hmm. Has it already arrived in the gutter in most instances? I think so. Um, you know, I mean, obviously there are still some quality papers, um, not too many in Australia anymore, unfortunately, no. I believe. But there were, a lot of, there were a lot of characters too that, yeah. you know, um, I'm just trying to think of... Uh, local ones? Or yeah, the local, local the, ones. Or the Des Cahoons Des and the Cahoon, like. Yep. I mean, let's, let's, let's honour Des. He was fabulous and every day he managed to bring out a comment. We also had some really great um, you know, caricatures. So, we, you know, every day our cartoonists were fabulous. Mike Atchison, I mean, a lot of these people aren't with us anymore. Oh. But they were immensely... Um, fabulous to listen to, uh, but we had people like Bill Guy who we've lost only in the last couple of years. 
I used to go to a paper bag luncheon with him once a week. He was the foreign editor yeah. and he would invite any journalist from a 19-year-old rookie yeah. to a senior journalist to come along and hear what was happening in the world that week. Yes. And he would just walk around the globe. During because, you know, you younger people could sit at the feet of these people and learn oh, a great deal. Don absolutely. Riddell was a great Don name. Don Riddell was my editor. He was fabulous. I mean, he's still around. I catch up with him once a year or so. We have a um, reunion of all the old journos around the place still. And it's fantastic who turns up and what they've got to offer. John Scales. There mm. some oh, yes. There's people that were in my life. And right from the very, very top, I mean, there was um, Sir Kenneth May. Mm-hmm. And he was before my time. Yeah, mm-hmm. but there, there were a whole, uh, a raft whole of raft people. of, yeah, of yeah, people yeah. of great talent and character and integrity. Yeah, um, where are they? Yeah. Are? Well, I don't know. We're, we're, uh, Thank it, goodness you're back on air, Jeremy. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying commentary to think. Commentary in the comments, I like it. But you've got a man, you've got a man like Rupert Murdoch, who has been a part of all of. Uh, I mean, he rubbed shoulders with great journalism and great journalists. Mm. You'd imagine he would be a hundred miles an hour behind keeping all of those standards, whether it related to people or it related to the uh, stories or the origin of the stories or the research that went into those stories. You'd, he, you'd imagine he would be a purist because he could afford to be a purist. Yeah, yeah but I think the cost of journalism has gone up Radically, I mean, um, when we started in journalist, journalism, we were on fairly lowly wages and advertising dollars really supported having good journalists on board. There are so many other mediums for advertising now. Mm. I think the cut in money spent on advertising meant that they looked at where they could cut dollars and unfortunately the journalists were the first area to go and that's been a problem for more than... 20 years, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there were, there were cuts to the staffing for journalism when I was there and it was terrible to watch people that were fabulous journalists but were retrenched and other people were picking up two jobs and three jobs and then syndication. And all of that happened because the advertisers could look at radio and look at television and look at other sources and now social media advertising, um, the bucks aren't there and I think that's hard. It still costs a lot of money. <laughs> I, and you're right, I mean, people like Murdoch are making squillions of dollars so their profit margins haven't been affected. I get that. But it's still something that shareholders want to make a buck. Yeah, but you've got to do more and more with less and less and sooner mm. or later you're just going to get down to the bare bones and it's... It's, yeah. it's not going to work. Well, and I think that, you know, we're a one-paper town. That's another thing that's really a worry. I mean, uh, I don't count the Sunday Mail as being a separate paper. Um, it, it's no not a great quality paper, and that's, again, because the quality journalists aren't there anymore. And the competition isn't there anymore either. Yeah. Uh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. But, what are we doing? But uh, when I started in radio, there was a, a sort of an unwritten... AJA, you know, the mm-hmm. uh, Journalists' Still. Union. Still. Uh, there was the, the the rule that, you know, you could have uh, one A grade. Yes. Or a super A grade. Yes. yes. Which related to their experience and yes. their uh, pay packet. But for every A, you had to have a couple of Bs, two and Bs, several threes, and a couple of you cadets. Know, rookies. Yep. Correct. Yep. Yep. Correct. And so the structure of that made a lot of sense. Yes. Yes. It, 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 it was a, a thing that the broadcasting industry worked with for years and years and years. You say yeah. it still works like that? Well, no, no, no. I, I, I mean, I think it's probably still there because I think there are a few senior journalists still there and I can think of them. And um, I could name a few locally, but it's across the board. So I, I think that those categories probably still exist, but there's just fewer of each. So when there might have been... 15 or 20 A graders and then the, the relevant numbers of Bs and Cs and Ds and cadets, yeah, 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 that's yeah. all disappeared and now you'll find there's one or two A graders yeah. and three or four B 
right? So it's just a culling across the board that's yeah. happened. I like the idea of the, the, the time when uh, Des Cahoon wasn't a... You, know, you didn't think of him as a journalist. He was a star. He was. It was just like he would just go down to the pub and uh, he'd write his column down there or... or Absolutely. In fact, we had a couple of columnists <laughs> that, that wrote there, had their typewriter and wrote from the pub. From the pub, yes. And they had a phone that went directly from the advertiser to the Criterion yes. and to the Union Hotel. But this went, is colourful and interesting. Because fabulous. you're going to get a lot more got stories in the stories criteria. In the pub. <laughs> correct and correct and inspiration too. I mean, um, uh, one of my predecessors, who again is not with us, Christabel Hurst. Um, I didn't know she died. She did. She did, unfortunately, a couple of years back now. Oh. And um, but Christabel had a wonderful vocabulary, and she managed to write a brilliant story. And uh, but you know, she often had a drink when she was writing it. She was at her best when she had a drink in hand. Yes, Jeremy, that you've had the odd drink, and I'm sure you've been a colourful columnist when you've had a drink in your <laughs> left hand too. I, I, I don't know. I think um, it goes hand in hand with the job. It probably does. You know. Um, um, and that's partly because as a morning newspaper, uh, you tended to come on duty at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and work until 11 o'clock at night because oh. you wanted the news to be later than as late as possible and as new as possible. Yeah. So a lot of our staff worked until 2 o'clock in the morning um, doing the sub-editing and the formatting and then the guys over in the composing room worked even later uh, so that the paper was printed and put on the back of a truck to get to Narra Court, for instance, mm. at 4 and 5 a.m. But what used to happen is that because you work till 11 o'clock or 2 a.m., very few of your friends outside the paper were still awake. They were home tucked up in bed. Sure. So the only thing that you could do was get together to wind down after that day of adrenaline and work at 12 o'clock or 1 a.m., was to go down to the local pub and just have a drink and a calm down and often dinner at mm. that time of night. And we were very lucky because the Union Hotel was owned by one of our sub-editors and his wife. Oh, so yes. the police used to let us, or not us but them, leave the hotel open because pubs used to close at 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. But the union had almost a special licence to stay open until... I like those arrangements. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> so we could get a dinner at 1am a, 1 a. Yeah. before going home at perhaps 2am, mm. having seen our paper and our article get into the paper. So yeah. it was a different lifestyle. But, yeah, the pubs but, were very important. But the best, best, best years of one's life, I would think. Yeah, they were. I mean, I, I loved my job. Um, and I, as I said, I still consider myself a journalist. Who was the greatest influence on you? Oh, probably um, Marina. Your, your, your well, Marina and I were peers and partners in crime or partners in fashion, which was fabulous. I mean, Marina's um, one of my favourite people in the world. Uh, we are related, obviously, as you yes. know, because um, we. Cousins, basically. Yeah. And she was the fashion editor at the Sunday Mail when I was the fashion editor at the Advertiser. And all the fashion people loved us because we never competed with each other. We rather talked to each other and picked a different angle or a different label or whatever. And so we never, ever... Um, went against each other and when we went into state to look at ranges all the designers loved us because instead of having to find two hotel rooms Marina and I were always very happy to share a hotel room and giggle and have fun mm, afterwards mm, mm. so we always traveled together we always sat together and rather than you know going to opposite ends of the rooms we would always sit together and be very happy in each other's company it was an opportunity to spend time together and um uh, She's very dear to me and I'd like to think I am to her. And so it was a wonderful, wonderful job that we both had, yes. um, writing yeah. fashion for two different papers but doing it in a complementary rather than a Because her brother is your father. Correct. Right. Tell but me. But my dad died about a month ago. So, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I didn't so, know that. Uh, dad died of, um, yeah, just, just a month ago while I was overseas. How old was he? Uh, 91. Oh, right, 91. So I had a pretty good long life. <coughs> yes. Um, but an interesting life. Um, I remember my daughter used his life story in her Year 12 paper. Um, <clears throat> he um, escaped communism in Hungary to come out here 
and um, you know came out here with absolutely nothing and had to start from scratch like so many other people did. Yes. Uh, but um, we had a very famous um, part of our family because his father, my grandfather, helped Raoul Wallenberg in getting thousands of Jewish people out of Hungary yeah. um, after World War Two and helping them with false papers and my grandpa was called the baker mm. so he and his wife my grandmother baked the papers and then he would meet with them yeah. and that's why he was called the baker yeah. and there's now a room dedicated to him in the Raoul Wallenberg Museum in Sweden because grandpa used a very old-fashioned Morse code yeah. of um, having sorry somebody there <laughs> of having that's not my phone no no, no. <laughs> hang on hello Jeremy, sorry to interrupt you again. Uh, you know, this voice thing that uh, is on and they want you to write yes or no on the, the voting uh, Oh, paper. yes, 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 yes. As, as you're aware, there's a lot of uh, people from other parts of the world who are not au fait with English. Yeah. What was wrong with having a simple instruction of if you're voting yes, you put a line through the no in biro so it can't be erased, right, yeah. or vice versa. Yeah, well, it's, it's going to be uh, leading up to the actual vote. I think it's going to sort of play on all our paranoia, the collective paranoia of the, uh, the voting public. But the, the, to my mind, the, the, the best way for them to have done it would have been to have uh, one square with yes in it and one square with no in it. Yep. And ha however you indicated uh, the yes or the no square, it would be unambiguous and quite clear whether you were speaking English or putting a cross or putting a tick, uh, y you, you would have designated, chosen one of those two boxes. And the only yeah, way sure. your vote could be informal would be if you tried to uh, choose both boxes. That, that, oh, that would muck it up. Or write write extra comments on the on the um, yeah probably the voting paper probably uh, just another brief thing nurses up in uh, Queensland you know with COVID yeah uh, they lost fifteen hundred people stepped like there was about a thousand resigned and five hundred refused to work because of the um, uh, COVID vaccination well the uh, Queensland government have now decided to take the um, uh, 500 nurses back um, without having to have the vaccination, but 200 out of the 500 will have to face a discipline, um, uh, you know, discipline action because they broke a contract. Yeah, well, I can't imagine how it would be that nurses would uh, argue with being uh, vaccinated, but. I don't understand that. I would have thought uh, nurses would have been in, incredibly enthusiastic about uh, vaccination because they 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 are uh, aware. Um, anyway, no counting for taste or whatever. Where were we? Thanks, John. Thanks for the call. Um, what were we saying? Okay, I was about to ask you about uh, your father. You you know, mm -hmm. it, is it true that uh, you were he tried to pick you up <laughs> that he didn't that he didn't recognize you yes it's true <laughs> <laughs> i oh sort of goodness me. i sort of love that story <laughs> what was uh, the what uh, was uh, the context okay so um my mother and father separated when i was 4 and uh, i didn't see him again for thereafter and i'd gone out when i was about 18 um, and again, you didn't have that to, red jumper on, did you? Probably not. <laughs> but, um, but I was certainly out having a, an official drink because I was 18 years old, and back in those days, that's how old you had to be. And um, this fellow came into the bar and joined the group that I was with, and uh, he attempted to. He, he thought I looked like a good sort, and he. Well, you do look like a went, good sort. Well, I did then. And <laughs> you do. Um, he, he spoke to one of my friends and said, are you, going, are you dating her? And he said, no, she's just a friend. And so he said, well, do you mind if I cut in? And he said, oh, I'll introduce you. <laughs> and uh, he came over and he knew who he was and he just said, you know, I'd like you to meet your daughter. 
love it, which Dad turned on his heels and walked oh, out of the place. But yes, uh, it was a, it was an embarrassing moment, I guess, for both him and our friends. I think I was probably just in shock. Yes, yeah, so, but growing up without your father, mm. and he was in the same city. He was, mm. but you just never crossed paths. No. Um, you know, divorces were fairly acrimonious oh, back God, in yes, those they, days. They and, um, still can be. Yeah, and mum was very hurt by the breakup mm. and dad had another woman mm. and um, remarried. And I think that, um, you know, because in, the, in those days, in order to divorce, you had to have grounds. And so um, in order to have grounds of adultery, the wounded partner had to witness the other person having adultery. And so that meant that mum had to stalk around or skulk around in the middle of the night with a um, private detective Mm -hmm. and witness the love of her life being intimate with somebody else. And that's so damaging, thank goodness, um, that's not the case anymore. No. Now you have no ground divorce. and But back then you did have to do that and it scarred mum terribly and she wanted nothing to do with my father. Mm. Did you ever forgive him? Um, I don't think... I think I was probably mature enough to understand why their marriage failed and uh, mum was older than dad, dad came to this country with all sorts of his own personal scars and baggage Mm. from having escaped communism and um, living in a a, through the war and his life experience was different to my mother's and I think as a consequence I do understand why they broke up. Um, She put him through university though, didn't she? Yeah, she did and she did, you know, she wanted him to be a doctor and he wanted to be a doctor and she had the um, finances to fund that. Um, but, you know, those sorts of things, uh, what I would have loved was for Dad to have found a way to make room in his new life for his old children. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he did that. I mean, he, he had several marriages during his life. Mum was the first wife, but she wasn't the last. And uh, so I guess in that respect, um, you know, I, I, th- I think that Dad had issues from his own childhood, so I never really begrudged him moving on, I just wish he'd included us in his life. I think that's something that he didn't do. And I see, you know, I mean, um, most um, divorce is quite common now, but if you do it right, then your children are still part of your life and part of the love that you feel for them, even if you fall out of love. You can still respect your partner or your ex-partner and that's the way I think it should be. And um, I can't imagine being without my children in my life and I wouldn't have wanted to uh, do that to another half, but they did mm. do it to each other and we were the, uh, the consequence of that was that we didn't see our father for many years. I re-made contact with Dad when I got pregnant. Mm. And, um, <clears throat> and that's another story that relates back to... Um, Sunnyside Road, but we could go there too if we're talking <laughs> home trees. Um. <laughs> yes, because that's where she was conceived, isn't it? Yes, well, yes. she wasn't conceived in your home, oh. but she was conceived elsewhere. But if you recall, you were opening, and I think it was Perisher or Breathtaker or oh, one of those right. lodges. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Breathtaker in Victoria. And yeah, you couldn't yeah. go to the, you couldn't attend unless somebody babysat your then young children. Yes. And so we agreed to give you a weekend off to open the ski lodge and we would (laughs) babysit. And the condition was that you would provide us with a dinner each night. Uh And uh, we got up there and had dinner and and I woke up the following morning and I was sick as a dog. And I remember saying, I bet it was the cooking. I bet it was the evening (laughs) meal. I bet it was off. Uh But I felt better by lunchtime and ate for the rest of the day and then ate the dinner that you'd left for us that night as well. And I woke up the following morning and I was again sick as a dog. Uh oh. And this happened three mornings in a row. And my husband turned to me and I said, he said, I don't think it's the dinner. I think she <laughs> might be pregnant. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, well. True story. So that was the first baby. That was yeah. in 1982, I suppose. Ever thought about a book? Often. 
often, lots of the stories that I have I'd love to put into a book, um, short stories maybe for putting people to sleep. might only take three pages. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, you know, yeah, I, you know, I think about how my daughter met her husband and uh, that was a little romance novel in itself in Paris. And um, I think about some of the experiences that I've had as well and the people I've interviewed. <laughs> um, I got the only, I think I got the only interview the Eagles had ever given uh, or the first anyway, uh-huh. um, and various things like that. And I'd love to put them all in a book one day. Most memorable person you've interviewed or met in your journalistic journey? Oh, that would be hard. That would be hard. There have been so many. But um, memorable. I think some of the Dita um, Cobb was a fantastic interview. That she I did. was an she interesting was, lady. She was fascinating. Um, and certainly on a global scale, I think that um, uh, Arthur... Um, what's his name, dear old um, dead now? I played the piano with him and it was fantastic. Arthur? Uh, no, no, no. Um, he played Arthur and I'm having a complete mind. mind um, Dudley Moore. Dudley Moore. The oh, late, Dudley Moore. The late Dudley the Moore. The sixth thimble. He was, but he was, yeah, but he was fantastic. And I, and I went in there for like a 20 minute interview. You're lucky to get out. Well, that's right. We spent <laughs> such a long time together that um, he ended up, we ended up playing the piano and singing together and that was great. Um, and then uh, Mirka Mora, um, uh, she's an artist, uh, again deceased, uh, from Melbourne. And I was fascinated because I'd been over to Melbourne and seen the paintings near the Flinders station that she did. Um, and she'd also done some in a hotel that I'd stayed in. And I decided I wanted to get to meet her. So I found out that her son, William Mora, had a gallery in Fitzroy. So I went out to see him and I said, I'd, I'd love to interview your mother. And he said, well, good luck with that. He said, she'll either like you or she'll slam the door in your face. And he was quite serious about that. And he said, here's the address, but be prepared. She could well slam the door in your face. So I went over there and I knocked on the door and I she opened it and I told her what I wanted to do and she slammed the door in my face. <laughs> and I was still recovering when she opened it and she said, I think we're going to be friends. And she invited me in and her house was incredible. It was even more cluttered than yours. Impossible. And, no, 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 it was <laughs> indeed. And we got on famously and we made cups of tea and the, during the course of the day we had lunch and afternoon tea and dinner and she did some crying and I did some crying because she was a Holocaust survivor yeah. and a lot of her art, art reflected that. We got on so well that we started talking and writing to each other and whenever I was in Melbourne, I'd go there and Annabelle ended up painting with her. Some of her art has got parts of Annabelle's painting in it. That's my daughter. Yeah. And um, she was just the most fascinating person. And I went to a, a retrospective of her work um, out at Heidi when I was there last and it was um, – I miss her. I miss her in my life. So she was an interview that became a friend. Mm. Yeah. So a lot of people like that. Yeah, it's one of the sort of perks of the job, really, <coughs> that you oh. have this this opportunity. It's sort of like a pass, and, and you can talk to people, in, really interesting people, and you can ask them all sorts of sometimes, you know, personal questions like... Uh, like what you've been doing to me today. Yeah, so like, did, did your father really <laughs> pick you up? <laughs> Correct. Um, I should have said, you know, I take the oath on that one. Look, you know, it's what I was saying to somebody the other day. I loved being a journalist. It was a passion. It wasn't a job. I mean, yes, I got paid for it. But I look at my life and what it might have been if I'd chosen any other career. And there is not a day in my life that I didn't meet somebody Mm -hmm. that was worth listening to and hearing their story. And I remember you had that line about 15 minutes of fame. And I think that's true. Everybody has in them at least 15 minutes of fame. But the people that I got to meet were people that had really made the most of their lives and had so much to say and so much that I learnt from and I I thoroughly enjoyed everybody I ever interviewed. What took you from, uh, you know, pursuing journalism Mm. in in some form uh, into real estate? Because you were very successful and still are. You you, you still have your uh, shield or what are your your licence or whatever it is. Both of them, absolutely. Um, (laughs) So I've still got a lifelong um, press... Uh, membership, which is very valuable to me. As I said, I always still feel a journalist. But I also use a lot of that in real estate. And so what made the move? Um, I retired 
instantly when my daughter, Annabelle, had a baby at 23 weeks and uh, she was in Paris and her husband rang me and said, do you think to come to Paris? And I said, oh, yes, I'll be there in September. And he said, no, Annabelle will have the baby tonight at 23 weeks. So I jumped on a plane fully expecting just to be there for a few days of grief counselling. But this little tyke who is bilingual and beautiful and fabulous um, was a survivor and a hero in my eyes. And I gave away work and I came back to Australia five months later because I stayed there until Esther, that's Mm -hmm. her name, was uh, released from hospital. And when she finally was released and I knew that the worries were over and she was 100% perfect and everything was going to be fabulous, I came back to Australia. But I had been doing a little bit of work for real estate agents and writing copy. So there was the journalism link Mm. and... um, Uh, the person I now work with rang me out of the blue and said, look, I understand you're back in Australia. Why don't you come in and see me? I've always said that you could sell real estate better than some of the real estate agents around. Put your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. I'll give you six months to prove it. Mm, And if you can't sell a house, then you're out the door and no questions asked. Well, give me something to do and I'll never let go of it. (laughs) So um, I went in there with a modest expectation and within two years I'd been named South Australia's Agent of the Year. And Great. I, I didn't did know that. that. Yeah, yeah. I won it in 2021 and 2022. The 23s haven't been announced How many yet. houses do you have to sell to do that? Uh, it's a, Well, the award is not just on numbers. So the RESA, that's the Real Estate Institute of South Australia, awards Salesperson of the Year, which is the award I won two years consecutively, um, to the person who has uh, had the best reviews, who has had the best uh, lot of marketing and every story I've ever written, um, every every paper um, has supported me. So for most properties that I've sold, I've had an editorial in the paper um, because I write well. Um, I also communicate well so that I've won communication points. Yes, I've sold quite a few properties, um, but it's not just about the number of properties. You know, you can sell a lot of properties that doesn't make you a good agent. Um, Mm. A good agent is somebody that really helps their clients move through the process of selling and also helps the purchaser move through the process of buying and that everybody's happy at the end and has had a really good relationship Throughout the process, the the buyer thinks they haven't paid too much. The seller knows they didn't sell too cheaply, and so it's the relationships that you build that help to do that. Can so, you, you you make it sound like uh, you can please everyone? Well, you can if you do it right. You can. Well, it's it's, it's interesting. It should be it should be like that. And you know, real estate agents have had a terrible reputation. And one of the things that I was really keen about was that that wouldn't be what happened to me. I would make sure that everybody really Be recommended different. me and that they loved being with me. And you know what? I've been in – most people continue the relationship with me well afterwards. Yeah. Um, I've, I've had dinner in their homes. They have a baby. They'll send me a text saying, guess what, Chrissy? Two years later, you know, we've just had a baby, wanted you to know, etc. Yeah, well, that's building a relationship, isn't it? Yeah. We'll see what this is, Chrissy. Hello. Hello, Jeremy. Brendan from IT Shop. Oh, Brendan. Hi. How are you? Very well. How are you? Good, 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 good. I'm sitting here with Christine Esau, who is a wonderful journalist and a real estate agent and uh, probably about to be uh, a, 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 an author, <laughs> oh, <laughs> a lady of many parts. Obviously not someone who sits around and does nothing. Uh-huh. No, she is. I, I can't imagine you. Sitting around doing nothing? No, not a lady for lunch. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> uh, Brendan, how do I describe you? You're a, 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 an IT expert, and uh, particularly in the field of uh, artificial intelligence? Um, yeah, artificial intelligence. Um, I run a, a small company up in the Sunshine Coast in Noosa where we look at fields like that. We, we also do mobile phone, laptop repairs. We do um, business management um, as well as a bit of a retail shop. Oh well, I'm so, glad. I'm, I'm glad that you found us. I see. You yeah. know, we would sit here, me being terrified that somebody's going to be smart enough to uh, replace me with artificial intelligence, 
And and uh, oh, I don't Chris, think that'll ever. Happen. I think that'll well, happen. And Christine is thinking, well, look, journalism. <laughs> if these if these proprietors could figure out a way to do without journalists, and maybe AI is one of the things they're looking at, even as we speak. Yes, but um, as we as we discussed uh, last time, they can't um, co- they can't imitate or react the same way you do, and that's what differentiates you from a robot, you know, from AI. Your creativity, the ability to analyze very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose so. I, it, it is very easy if you are insecure, and most people I know in the in the radio or television, or not so much journalism, because journalists seem to be much more in demand than people who talk for a living. Uh, <laughs> you know, you. you well, I was, I was pleasantly surprised to find out how many people up here listen to you and know you. Oh, really? I'm I'm, I'm surprised. Yes, yeah, well, um, a few people have already come and commented about our last conversation uh, and they'd listened to you down in Melbourne, um, in New South Wales, uh, South Australia. We've got quite a transient community come through here and retire here. Oh, well, I can, un- I can, I can, I can understand that. It's a beautiful part of the world. It certainly is. Yeah. I was there earlier this year. I love it. No, so. yeah. what, what's the real estate up, up, up there like? Very expensive, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's probably the most expensive postcode in um, Australia, that and Wallara, I think probably. Yeah. Uh, We've got a saying up here, if you can afford to live here, you don't work here, and if you work here, you can't afford to live here. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> I, I remember yeah. buying, uh, looking at buying a property um, just near the park at the end of Noosa and at the time it was about a million dollars and um, it oh, seemed like wow. a lot of money and it had a tennis court with it so it was, you know, pretty special and we didn't do it. We uh, bought in Sydney instead and I was up there and it was on the market again and it was $27 million. And I realised that I'd made, a, oh, I'd made a twenty-six million dollar yeah. mistake. <laughs> well, uh. we were looking at a property to buy to move the shop to, and it was sold for six hundred thousand um, three years ago, and it went for two point five. There you are. Yeah, that's four hundred percent. Four hundred percent in three yep. years. So that gives you an indication of what ten years looked like. Mm. Mm, amazing. So, I'm actually giving you a call in relation to some AI news, where it's actually endorsing and supporting. Um, people in the South Australian region, uh, in particular the Fireys. Well, tell me so, about that. Okay, so um, the New South, sorry, the South Australian uh, Fireys have worked in conjunction with a company called Pano AI, AI where they're in, using the AI process through video surveillance, you know, camera surveillance, on the what you refer to as the Green Triangle Forestry region. The ability that this brings to them is to be able to identify in key areas exactly what type of fire is going on. And with the fire season about to come up, and obviously we follow the Northern Hemisphere's um, uh, weather, we've got a very drastic weather uh, forecast for fires across Australia this year. So this, the fires in New South Wales, oh, I'm sorry, my fault, the fires in South Australia have taken the ownership of it and they've invested in this camera operation, which is looking after a $680 million uh, uh, program uh, of forestry that obviously supports the uh, South Australian uh, economics uh, to make sure that not only does it manage the fires when it happens, but to actually get the right resources there in a very quick and timely format. Most of Australia uses satellite recognition Yep. Satellite recognition revi- requires, for each cell, is about 500 um, metres. So you can imagine how long it takes for a fire in, a, in a, one of those squares at 500 metres to light up, get to a stage where it's actually noticeable by a satellite, then to notify the, uh, the, the authorities that there's a fire and all the time and communication in between to get the fire is out there to find out that you get everybody out there or the wrong equipment to the site. This eliminates all that, and it makes it very, very quick. So artificial intelligence can uh, fight fires better than the uh, old-fashioned teamwork of people on the ground? Well, it does in in many ways because it can identify it. It tells you what type of environment it is in it, what type of um, vehicles are needed to get to that environment. So you're not wasting time. Ah. So it pinpoints it. 
uh, latitude and longitude. Have, have, so the, have, have the, uh, the establishment, the fire is as such, accepted or embraced this new technology? Very good question. I would hope so. I think anything that gets the right people and the right resources in a timely manner to prevent the fire from exploding would be endorsed by almost anybody and everybody. And I can really see that insurance companies, landowners, and I would hope the government would definitely see the advantage of employing or employing a AI a system across the state, let alone um, across the country. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, now, if, I do you, know, if you if you sell them the idea, I mean, South Australia is a is an interesting uh, test bed. I don't know. I think well, we, we probably had roll-on deodorant before anyone else in the country. I mean, <laughs> as a test, a test market, they've used South Australia quite often to get things off the ground, so why not artificial intelligence fighting fires? Well, roll-on roll on deodorant, eh? I don't think we've even got that up here in Queensland yet. Well, you probably don't um, need it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not buying into that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, Anything that's going to save lives, save property, uh, and anything that's going to enhance the ability of humans to not only do their job, and that has to be a good thing. Oh, well, it makes so, sense. It makes sense. But people do sometimes fight a rear guard action against uh, progress that looks like uh, doing things more efficiently or sort of taking, taking my job or people are highly suspicious of, of uh, technology when it gets that personal. Oh, absolutely, and you should always be wary of technology. But I think in this particular case, the fact that it's actually enhancing and assisting and aiding, it's not really taking anyone's job. It's setting up um, towers that weren't there or, or enhancing the towers that are there, and it would actually uh, probably develop jobs. You've got people who've got to maintain, monitor, um, uh, uh, build the programs, do the algorithms, and obviously uh, sell it. So can you, can you Brendan, work. can you just explain to me in simple terms that I can understand just exactly what is artificial intelligence? That is a very good question. Artificial intelligence right now is like a putting a, a finger on a map. It's got so many sub-council areas underneath your finger that haven't been defined yet. Over the next two years, you'll find that you'll get AI generation, AI um, coding, AI implementation, AI sales. But AI also covers robotics, it covers programming, it covers uh, any type of uh, machine-driven or automated uh, console, automated interaction, touchscreen. It's all perceived under the one heading. So over the next two to three years, I'd say more likely two, you'll find that they'll be redesigned, renamed, rebranded. Mm. across the world as we all as the technology develops and gets more and more um, advanced plus also laws will come into place hopefully that will uh, bring it more into bound with uh, keeping humans in jobs so and not taking jobs and for one reason or another we will be less frightened of it and its potential to and I've heard people say destroy the world well it, look it has the potential to do that if you look back in the no early 1980s, when AI, uh, once again, it was a very generalised term, they built a few computers like the Big Blue and a few others early on, where they were found to be quite capable of getting on the internet and doing quite a bit of damage. Mm -hmm. They were mm -hmm. unplugged and they were um, constrained by laws. So there are laws in certain countries where no computer can give orders or directions to any human, uh, regardless of the position. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure in Australia that those laws are simplified and carried out so no international company can run a computer to run us as humans in Australia. So by doing that, we can then curtail the potential growth, which is what's happened the last 30 years through these laws that has stifled the growth of, um, of AI. And we need to put into place now laws that keep that stifling and control intact. Otherwise, it does have the potential where our worst nightmares could come true. Yeah. Um, as I, was, I was speaking a couple of weeks ago about a robot that they uh, gave free will to, to a degree, mm. as much as you possibly can. And his job was to take boxes from one part, turn around and put boxes down on, uh, on a shelf. And after 15 minutes worth of work, it turned itself off. And when they did the diagnosis on it, 
it came to its own conclusion that it had no further opportunity to grow or to expand, and it turned itself off. Lost interest. It lost interest. <laughs> okay. All right, so, Brendan. As I mean, always, as always, it's lovely to talk to you, and thank you very much for ringing in. Thank you very much for having me once again. Thank you. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Enough. Up there, sunning himself in that beautiful g- place, beautiful part of beautiful the world, beautiful part of the world, mm. and and first day of spring. Can't believe that. I'm pretty happy that we've got some warmer weather coming our way. I don't like the winter and I don't like the cold. No, I don't. I, I do understand. I just like the new life that sprouts out in the garden. Absolutely. And your garden's looking beautiful. Mine's just starting. Leaves are back. Roses are on the way. I've got to sit down and have a talk to you because I keep on thinking uh, this house, uh, it's kind of gorgeous. My size. Yes. You know? But Beautifully the fl- place up on the hill. It's uh, so much work up there, but I'd never be able to pack everything up. True. It would be impossible. Impossible. So. Impossible. Um, I think the first thing we'd have to do is get you out of scammels. That would be the well, first that's, step, wouldn't it? Well, the <laughs> trouble with that, you see, I think they have, they have a vested interest in keeping me alive because they think to themselves, well, if he dies, um, all of that stuff that is going to come back. Yeah, or, or all that profit of going out the door. But my, they won't mind. They, they, they make money on the in and the out. So yeah, well, it's the problem. get it coming and get it going. <laughs> but I, I must admit it's, it fascinates me to see what people um, part with, part with mm, yes, and I, sometimes I, throw away. I had withdrawal symptoms when I was away, but I must admit Annabelle had a fabulous mirror in her hall when I arrived, which I didn't hadn't seen before, and I said to her, where did you get that? And she said, Mum, that's the difference between Adelaide Street trash and <laughs> Paris. And she picked up a stunning 18th century gilt mirror that had been abandoned um, on the street Good in God. Paris. That's our fluence. Thought, you know, we, we have our hands up sort of trying to bid for something like that and uh, yeah. it was street trash in Paris. Mm. Yeah. Lovely to see you, Christine. Lovely to see you, Jeremy. And, again, my congratulations and, in fact, I'm so thrilled that you were back on the air. I do think that uh, Adelaide has been lacking that talk back commentary that you do so well. Well, And no, your I, comments are so valuable for conversation and for keeping everybody thinking. So sweet. thank you for being You're sweet. on the air. And the, the reason I do it really is that um, I suppose I, I started out doing the thing in the garage just to keep my mind working because the moment you don't mm. do that, I don't know exactly what happens, but I don't want it to happen to me. Well, I think it comes back to what you were saying earlier, that we're not ladies that lunch and you're not a gentleman that does it either. No. Um, you know, you, no. you, it, it makes you vital, it keeps you vital and you've got something to say. So while you've still got something to say, keep on saying it. That's Take care of yourself. The lovely Christine Esau, ladies and gentlemen.